the of the Mod Center and uh, the host of the series Talking with Experts in Women's Health and Reproduction. It's a great pleasure to have this month Dr. Ruhi Jalani, who will be talking to us a subject of high interest that is associated with reproduction. Uh, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to hearing uh, more, learning more about uh, infertility and answering many of the questions from uh, the audience. But before we, we go to the subject, let me ask you, would you mind to introduce yourself to everybody? Of course, my name is Dr. Ruhi Jalani and I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist. Wow, so a reproductive endocrinology specialist. Yes. That sounds a little complicated. Tell us a little, what is the meaning of reproductive endocrinologist? Yeah. Um, so a reproductive endocrinologist understands your endocrine system as it relates, so your hormone, as it relates to your fertility health. So not necessarily just infertility, but overall health, irregular bleeding, how your thyroid relates to that, menopause, bone health. So basically kind of what makes your reproductive system function outside of even infertility. And you see patients who are uh, at what ages? It's a before 16, after 16. What is the ages that uh, patients will come to see you when we talk about this endocrinological aspect? Yeah. So my kind of bread and butter is most people seek me out when they're actually trying to conceive. So oh, I, so that's the subject we're going to talk yes, to you at. Yes, Very for good. sure. But so that's, that's, why did you decide to do reproductive endocrinology? I actually was fortunate enough to be introduced to a reproductive endocrinologist with, when I was really young. So as a lot of people on here know, I have PCOS, and no one could figure out that I had PCOS. I was really no. young. PCOS, as for many people, is going to sound like a little Hebrew yeah. or Chinese yes. or whatever. Yeah. Tell us what exactly it stands for PCOS. PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome and it presents with irregular bleeding. So we'll talk more about that later. Yeah. So that's what I brought you to come to reproductive endocrinology. That's what introduced me to the field. To the field. field. And then when I asked the doctor what she does, she said, I make babies. And very plain and simple, that a 15 year old could understand. And I was completely baffled. I was like, oh my God, I thought God made babies and you can make babies. I wanna make babies. <laughs> so it, to become a reproductive endocrinologist, so you go to medical school. Yeah. After medical school, what do you have to do? So after medical school, you have to do a four year residency in ob -GYN. So you are obstetrics and gynecologist. Yes. And then? And then a subspecialty or fellowship for three years in reproductive endocrine or infertility. And, and that's what you are, yes. a reproductive endocrinologist in fertility. So let's talk about infertility. Yes. Would you mind to introduce us to this concept? What is infertility? So infertility, the definition of infertility is one year of unprotected intercourse. Um, because time is of the essence, you want to see a fertility specialist, i.e. us, sooner than later. So six months at between 35 to 40, and then over 40 sooner than later. So even without trying, you can seek out intervention. Interesting. So we're talking about the problem, but I think we are here. Yeah. So that means our mothers were able to reproduce. Exactly. Yeah? And maybe the empty chairs, some of the empty chairs that we have in the room, those are the cases that did not reproduce. So why don't we talk a little first about the normal reproduction. Yeah. A, what is a normal reproduction? What involves to, to have a baby? Yeah, so a normal cycle to have a baby is you need eggs, you need sperm, and you need fallopian tubes. Um, so if you want, whenever you yeah. want to put a picture of that to facilitate yeah. you, please feel free to yeah. let us know. Alyssa, can you load the slide? So what we're going to do is to put in the slide or what would yeah. be the female reproductive organ? Exactly. Just so we start with getting familiar with the, the terminology. Exactly. Yeah. And you have some, um, you have some people who wants to join us. Good, so um, here I think we have a graphic. Yeah. I don't know if this is something that will help you. Yeah, 
yeah, to introduce you, the subject. Yeah, if you go back, Alyssa, two slides. So to, in order to have a baby, you need three things that are essential, eggs, uterus, tubes, and sperm. And the sperm is coming from the father. So the father exactly. has something to do. Yes. Good, it's good to <laughs> know that. Third. <laughs> and the eggs are the oocytes. Yeah. Next slide, you'll see how they're all connected. So the little white structure there are your ovaries. The tubes are your fallopian tubes. That's where egg and sperm meet, kind of like the highway. Okay, so that okay, that's the highway that is yeah. will be carrying what? They carries the egg and sperm to meet. Okay, that's the meeting place. That's the meeting place. Yeah. So tubes are essential, and then it still uses the highway once it fertilizes and becomes an embryo, meaning half mom and half dad. Okay. To then land into the uterus to implant, and that right there is the cavity. And that's where we see the famous cavity. The uterus. That's what all of us wear for nine months yeah. in that cavity. Then the reality in the non-pregnant uterus is very small. Yeah. yeah. And it's amazing how then it grows to uh, to carry sometimes a huge baby. Yeah. Okay. So um, those are the components. Yeah. Now, explain to me a little about the endometrium. And we're talking about the uterus, but the, the uterus, although it's a big mass, the critical component to have the baby is the endometrium. Exactly. Yeah. Could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, if you can forward, Alyssa, there's a slide with an ultrasound on it. So the endometrial cavity, going a little bit more, one more, right cool. there. Okay. Perfect. So the endometrial cavity, so this is an ultrasound picture in a 2D of where the embryo would implant. So if you look, I call it um, a triple layer chocolate cake, oh. nice and fluffy. I'm getting hungry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the tiny, tiny embryo that looks, you can't even see it with your naked eye. It's like a dust bunny lands in there. Amazing. Eh? Yeah. It's amazing. So that little layer really is what it, it, it makes a pregnancy happen or not. Exactly. Yeah. So before we start talking about infertility, uh, tell us a little about the menstrual cycle. Yeah. yeah? Because I, I suppose that is extremely important to understand later when you will discuss about infertility. Exactly. So if you go back, I'm so sorry. If you go back on the slide, it kind of ties how the uterus and the ovaries, even though I personally like to think of them as two separate organ systems. Go back one more slide, please. Right here. So what happens is your brain is your conductor, the regulator of all your endocrine hormones. I like to say that the brain is the most important reproductive organ. Yeah. Do you agree with me? 100%. Good. That's what I always ask the students. What is the most important reproductive organ? And I may then I convince them that is the brain. Exactly. Good. Good to know. <laughs> um, so the brain, our conductor, makes food, which is FSH. That food then goes to your ovary. And then the ovary responds by secreting an egg, which then makes estrogen feeding back to the brain. So I always say it's like a mom and baby. Mm. So the mom makes food and the baby cooed back and gives it some estrogen. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. And estrogen is, is the hormone of the woman. Exactly. That it keeps the skin of the woman yeah. nice. But more important, prepares the reproductive organs to be ready to reproduce. Exactly. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what is happening during that menstrual cycle? So then that egg and also, in addition to talking to the brain, talks to the uterus mm. and says, I'm growing, and the uterus responds by making that fluffy lining we just saw um, with the estrogen. So if you go to the next slide, two more slides back to the ultrasound, you'll see the egg grows, makes the lining, makes estrogen. The uterus responds by creating it, making it nice and fluffy. Eventually, the egg gets nice and big, and then it signals the brain, the master, to say, and ready. So then it switches from now instead of making food, gears to what we call LH or luteinizing hormone, which we often check in our strips to see if we're ovulating. Okay, that is what it tells when a woman is sending the, the eggs outside exactly. to meet the husband. Exactly. <laughs> Good. So, but, but the two factors really, although it's easy to explain, they have to go through dramatic changes yeah. in order to be ready. Yeah. And that leads to my next question. So we talk about the human population is growing and growing and that we reproduce. We always say, oh, I have four kids, five kids, six. 
reality is not so easy to reproduce. Eh? No. What is the success rate of, of uh, natural reproduction? So that's age dependent, right? When you're looking at what is my natural chance of conception, and it truly starts with your age. So the younger you are, the chance of conception is higher. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, peak fertility is at age 23. Most peak fertility is 23. Yeah. It's still in our days. Still in our still days. Still is there. So evolution has not adapted uh, 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 in the 2021. Unfortunately, no. no. <laughs> and then after 23 to 28, you see a steady decline, very steady, so not a significant decline. So per month, chance of conception is about 15 to 20%. Mm. So that's why we say under 35, after one year of unprotected intercourse, you should have an 80% chance of one live birth and 100% positive pregnancy. But and the, what is the limiting factor in terms of the aging and reproduction? Because I was reading the paper and there was a lady that is 70 years old that she got pregnant with IVF. So what is the limiting factor of the reproduction as you say we are going in, in the aging? So as we get older, we start to lose our eggs. So if you go to the very first slide, you see that as females, we're born with all of our eggs. So our eggs are created when our mom is pregnant with us. So at birth, when you look at the egg cycle, a little bit back, one more, right here. So at mm, birth- That is a good slide. Yeah, yeah. At birth, we have 3 million. And as soon as we hit puberty, it goes down to 200,000. Massive attrition. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So a young girl is born, lost a lot of the eggs that originally were produced in the body. Correct. And then in every menstrual cycle, you will lose more eggs. Correct. And we think, oh, I'm losing one egg, but you're not. Our body recruits about 90 to 100 eggs. We ovulate one, and then we lose all the ones. So 99 have. eggs are lost in every menstrual cycle exactly. if it's not fertilized. Exactly. Wow. And where, when the woman is reaching the age of 40, what is happening to her eggs? So they're continuing to go down one quantity. So it's not only quantity. So another thing people say, well, what if I check my quantity? And it's good. It might defy age. So it's quality because they've been there for so long. I tend to tell my patients that they're becoming stickier. It's stickier. Oh my goodness. I haven't heard that. Yeah. What do you mean if he's becoming a <laughs> stickier? So then when you tell the soldier who's been sitting there for X number of years to march, divide into half, join the sperm, mm. it doesn't know how to walk. So when it breaks into half of the egg to then join half the sperm, it breaks unevenly. So oh, and it's also aged. It has age Correct. and potentially chromosomal aberrations exactly. that may lead to babies with com health complications. Exactly. Interesting. But the uterus remains strong. Eh? Yes. It's yes. fascinating that. Yeah. So the limiting factor for reproduction really is the all size, exactly. the number of eggs. Um, you know, I would love to continue this, but I think there is a lot of interest by the public in many of the aspects that we're discussing. Would you mind if we open some questions go to go with that? Yeah. Uh, let's see if the public, again, there are two ways that you can put your questions. You can either type it directly in the message or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, so and we receive already, by the way, several questions from the public. So I will start reading some of those and we will continue as they come. Uh, I have uh, one question. What impact may my taking birth control pills since a young age have on fertility? Are there any other common medications that impact fertility? And I think this is a question that affects many young women, especially working who they spend many years uh, in medical school like you or in uh, other professions and in order to prevent having the babies until they finish, they use the pill. So before we tell us a little, what is the pill? So birth control pill is basically working on that mechanism. So if you understand what we just spoke about, the brain being the conductor and the egg being the estrogen is kind of responding, birth control is synthetic estrogen and progesterone. So what it does is it tells the conductor, hey, you don't need to work. I'm working here. So it prevents ovulation. Mm. So shutting down the, the production of the, of the, or the, just the release of the oocyte. Correct. It still is producing oocytes. Exactly. So it's still the waste of oocytes. 
is going on. Exactly. Uh huh. Uh huh. So birth control pill does not change your fertility, does not impact your fertility long term. All it's doing is it's, a pre it's preventing ovulation. So it's very short term. And that myth that we hear that you need to be off of birth control for X number of months before you start trying is also a myth because if you're on a short term birth control, the minute you stop or say you accidentally miss the pill, you could ovulate through and get pregnant. But this is an interesting aspect that you say. Um, the, we go through the questions. The, um, the fact that people will take very long for a long period of times, the contraceptive may also have an impact because you are making, as you, I like what you say, making the soldiers become uh, not in, in, not trained, it, no active, yeah. uh, bored, or uh, what is your recommendation in terms of long-term um, and contraception or breaking? Yeah, so you don't necessarily need birth control breaks depending on what you're on, right? There's um, stronger ones that like implants, those devices may stay in your system a little bit longer uh, with an IUD, so an intrauterine device may impact your lining for a little bit. So that may take a little bit to bounce back. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily need a birth control break because remember that follicular recruitment and activation is still happening independent. All birth control is doing is temporarily stopping your FSH. So okay. your soldiers are still working. The soldiers are active. Because exactly. that is a major conception. So, oh, my eggs are not going to work anymore. Uh, but you say they are active. active. It's just not coming to the yeah. to the week. But now, a patient that have many questions in times that says, okay, I stop taking, I've been taking contraceptive for 10 years. I stop, I tried to get pregnant and I didn't pregnant immediately. So birth control, actually, believe it or not, the month that you stop, the following month, you're the most fertile. The mm -hmm. following three months, you're the most fertile. And then it continues to decline. It may just be a coincidence, right? Because when you check your hormones, right? when you get off of birth control and God forbid there's something wrong, then you automatically assume, well, I was on birth control. There's all these myths and misinformation around it. It must be that. Interesting. So we want to start asking some of the questions, but before we, go, we start approaching the questions, just so we bring everybody to the same page. Uh, I see there is a lot of questions about assisted reproduction. Could you tell us what is the meaning of assisted reproduction? Yeah. So Are you going to tell the husband how to do the baby or? <laughs> You can start there. You can start with that. <laughs> That's actually called the timed intercourse cycle. So very. There you go. Yeah. So assisted reproduction can include a variety of things, and I think one of the biggest myths is that if you see a fertility doctor, that you have to do IVF. Assisted reproduction equals IVF, which is not true. Um, one very simple is timed intercourse. So if we notice the problem is ovulation, then we give a pill to make you super ovulate, time it, and we say, okay, go have timed intercourse. So that's one way of doing it. Number two, if we say, okay, let's maybe there's a little bit of a male factor and a little bit of an ovulatory mm -hmm. factor, then we do the fertility pill and then we do an insemination or an IUI. So we kind of help regulate and control and optimize when you ovulate and how egg and sperm meet. And of course, the most extreme is IVF or in vitro fertilization, Latin for in glass fertilization meaning we take the egg, we take the sperm, fertilize it in a little petri dish, grow it to an embryo, right when it's about to implant into the uterus, then we transfer it into the uterus. And that is the IVF. Correct. And that is the, the full cycle of IVF that we call. Correct. Good. Um, there is a question here. Um, what are dangers of IVF hormones? Now that we know what is IVF, we can go a little to discuss the, the different uh, concerns. So the first one is, what is the dangers of IVF hormones? What hormones do you use for IVF? Yeah. So going back to our original, where we started, how does the brain and ovary work? So we said that the conductor, the brain makes food, which is FSH. So what IVF does is, well, if the brain gives food and it grows one egg and we want all of our eggs, how do we grow it? So we take synthetic FSH and synthetic LH to grow all of the eggs that we see there, that is known as your antral follicle count. So the goal is for 10 to 12 days, kind of like for 10 to 12 days before mm. you ovulate, instead of one egg, we're trying to optimize and take all those eggs. Mm. 
And what do you do with all those eggs? So remember, not all your eggs are good. Not all the eggs will make a baby. And there's a big attrition with that. So we take all the eggs out and we check for maturity, meaning that it divided into half of you. And then we fertilize those eggs. Okay, so only after looking at that, you will do the fertilization Correct. and then the fat. We have um, another question. I had my first diagnostic visit last week. Um, and the doctor counted five follicles per ovary. So that means that we have found 10 total? So your antral follicle count. So we said there's about 90 to 100 eggs that activate per month. And out of that, do you, Alyssa, do you have that um, slide? I'll show you. So out of that, it's like a champagne glass. So next slide, one more. So one more, sorry. So right here. Mm -hmm. So out of the 90 to 100, the six to 12 per side activate. And they said, pick me, choose me. They raised their hand. And those are your <laughs> antral follicle count. So if you were doing IVF and they saw five per side, those are the only ones that we can actually get. Because what's happening from that antral recruitment, we don't know yet, quite yet. The other ones will not, will not match, match with it. Correct. So yeah, they will not come out. Yeah. Uh, danger of IVF hormones. So IVF hormones are synthetic versions of exactly what your body's making naturally. So acute long-term effects like breast cancer, ovarian cancer is not there. During an IVF cycle though, if you get too much estrogen, meaning a lot of your eggs grow and somebody who has a lot of eggs, for example, a PCOS patient, mm -hmm. then they can be at high risk of what's called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Oh, so, so ovarian hyperstimulation is when the ovaries are producing too many follicles. Correct. Yeah. Okay. If there is any other aspect, for example, endometrial cancer, so, with all the hormones, do you think there is any risk for that? So you're not at an increased risk of endometrial cancer because you did IVF. Now, if you're PCOS, you might have a with irregular cycles. Mm. You might be predisposed or have a higher risk of endometrial or uterine cancer. Okay. Uh, can you, let's say, will it, okay, this is an interesting question because as you mentioned, once you take the oocyte and you put it with the sperm, you will have a little embryo, which is the one that you're going to transfer. But usually that happens, as you explained at the beginning, it's happening in the fallopian tube. Now you're doing it in a Petri dish. So one of our audience is asking, uh, can this process, will IVF culture process have an adverse effect on the embryo? IVF culture process will not have an adverse effect on your embryo, but there's a lot of debate that is, if the embryo is not making it in the culture process, is a mom's body a better incubator? Um, and of course, when we can't grow an embryo in culture, we always say, well, let's just do a fresh transfer, meaning take it out, fertilize it, and put it in before blastulation happens, meaning before the egg and sperm activate and separate into baby and placenta hoping that the mom's body is a better incubator. Absolutely, absolutely. So that means also some of the questions that we see coming, we need to prepare the body of the mother to, to hold it properly. Correct. Because IVF is not 100% successful. What is the success rate of IVF in general? In general, with IVF, creating an embryo, getting it to day five, meaning a blastocyst, when it separates into baby and placenta, is about 40 to 50 percent that's kind of national average yeah and but there is an impact also according with the age correct so the younger the higher, the higher success correct. the older is a challenge exactly but not impossible not impossible but if you add genetic testing and you're older mm. then you genetic testing is how the egg and sperm are coming together so kind of looking for that chromosomal abnormalities and once you confirm it's a normal embryo then the chance of success reverts almost back to independent of age, almost. And we are talking at the present time, having the oocyte from the same mother. Correct. Yeah? So, but I think we will go later, maybe if we have time to talk about when is donation of oocytes yeah. or eggs. Yeah. Eggs donations was becoming very popular in many places yeah. in the world and in a major business. Yes. But let's go back to the, the point that you said, the, the best one is the mother. The mother is the best incubator. So there are questions, how do we make sure that the mother is in the best situation 
to be the good incubator. And we have a question here. Can you talk about the possible impact helpful assistance of including acupuncture on your fertility treatment regime while also doing IVF? That's a very fascinating yeah, question. Yeah. Um, I, we, I personally do like acupuncture. So acupuncture um, is kind of going back to old, where it's like a merger right now, I feel like Eastern and Western medicine. So what is the premise mm -hmm. behind acupuncture? So acupuncture is saying, well, how do we increase blood flow to organs that are very essential and playing a critical role, such as with your eggs and then implantation with the endometrial lining. Um, so we typically say, let's incorporate it. Now, when you look at statistical significance and evidence-based medicine, you find very little data because like Dr. Moore was saying earlier that there's such a variability, meaning age, X, sperm, uterine, yeah. and everyone's so different, it's hard to control for it. So what works for one person may not work for somebody else. But so there is not a contraindication, let's put it like right. that if you do acupuncture, your IVF is going to fail and so on. Exactly. Although I don't, is there any clinical studies demonstrated a, a benefit of acupuncture and infer, infertility? Yeah, so we actually presented one at ASRM last year. We did a session of acupuncture before and after transfer. Wow. Um, of control was all PGT tested normal embryos of the same age group of women. And we found the ones that the acupuncture had a slightly higher positive pregnancy rate. Sounds fascinating. And you think this is an effect more than, um, again, yes. this is now more than the effect of the uterus, the endometrium, or better uh, ovulation. What do you think is the effect of acupuncture in terms of the biology or the components of the reproduction? Yeah. I think for personally, I think it's kind of taking, uh, eliminating that anxiety. So it's true. So all is systemic. Yeah. As I say, the brain, yeah. the best, the brain can be the best contraceptive also, yeah. or the best fertility. Exactly. As I say, a woman who is in a stress and trying to get pregnant is the best contraceptive. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. I couldn't agree more. Good. Uh, well, we can talk more about that, I hope. Yeah. I mean, as if we are already half time uh -huh. and we haven't covered even a third of all the questions mm -hmm. that we have. We may need to do it the second session yeah. to uh, yeah, continue we'll discussing this. Um, can you talk about um, what is it for people who? Um, okay, this is an interesting question. What types of lifestyle changes do you recommend before starting your IVF cycle? Diet, supplements, again, acupuncture that will really hurt. Yeah. So this is a great question. I always talk to my patients about what makes, what's optimal, right? Well, how should you treat your body as a whole? So a uh, Mediterranean diet has been proven to be the best mm. diet in fertility. So that's more whole grains, eliminating um, simple carbs, doing more complex stuff, supplements. So why does accelerated aging or infertility happen? So we talk about reactive oxygen species, right? Mm -hmm. Accelerated ovarian aging. So how do you fight these reactive oxygen species? Same thing that causes our skin to look bad or um, us to lose hair, right? So we say vitamin A, B, E, mm. C, coenzyme Q10, and acetylcysteine. Um, so we talk about potent antioxidants that can help egg health. Interesting. Now, all of these are in addition to treatment because nothing trumps treatment in age. That's our number one. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, I wish I wish we could <laughs> aging with everything else. So patients often ask, do we take a break and do all this for three months? Or do we do IVF? So I always say, do them tandemly and in conjunction because mm -hmm. nothing wins. Time always wins, unfortunately. Time always wins. There is the aspect also uh, of obesity. Yeah. Um, how obesity affects reproduction? Yeah, this is also a great question. So there's some studies that show the higher your fat volume, which causes lipid peroxidation, producing more reactive oxygen species mm -hmm. can then damage egg um, quality and lower fertilization. Translational research done in an animal model, harder to prove in a human because there's so many variables. But if you do look, the higher your BMI, the higher your miscarriage rate and more pregnancy-related complications. So may not necessarily directly go with infertility, but more pregnancy-related complications that have been more proven. Very interesting. So again, let's try to summarize a little here. Um, reproduction is a complex aspect that involves the brain not only by producing hormones, hormones, but also our attitude. Yeah. 
involves the body preparing the mother to have a good incubator, yeah. as you indicated. So eating well, exercising, and having a positive attitude always will improve your success rate of reproduction, yeah. right? So again, it's, uh, we're having with us, uh, Dr. Ruhi Jelani is talking about infertility reproduction in uh, the Mott Center, um, talking to the experts for those who joined us uh, recently. The aspect that comes now is the pathological conditions. And you started with your um, personal experience and thank you for sharing with us that uh, we have somebody who is asking, can you go more into PCOS and the challenges, success rate of getting pregnant? Diet to increase fertility? Yes, so PCOS is very complex. Um, once again, it stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a misnomer because you don't really have cysts. It should be polyfollicular. You just have a mm. lot of eggs, not necessarily good quality eggs. So when you say, well, how do you treat PCOS as a whole? Because it impacts you. Like I said, for me personally, at all ages, um, so from adolescent, teenager, mid-20s, to so then when you're actually trying to conceive. So diet that's best, once again, Mediterranean diet. Interesting. Because PCOS goes hand in hand with a lot, for a lot of people with metabolic syndrome. So um, abnormal lipid profile with high triglycerides, abnormal or elevated A1C, may not be completely into the diabetic range, but maybe in the pre-diabetic range or higher than normal. We also see a lot of um, implantation failure, but that's kind of deep diving into PCOS. Mm -hmm. And then it, we think it- So there is an impact on the endometrium as well. Correct. So not only then the ovaries. Correct. Uh -huh. So we think it has to do with, once again, the inflammatory milieu. Even though yeah. for me, I'm lean PCOS, and I know that's something I personally struggled with because I do have, being just Asian, that whole metabolic component with a family history. Of it. So there is a family component. There's yes. a genetic component. Correct. Yeah, which makes you more susceptible Correct. to the environmental factors that will develop that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, diet and increased fertility, we talk about that. So the next question that we have is some cycles of treatment requires OC, uh, OCPAs before cycle. Are the side effect of the long-term consequence to stopping and starting OCPAs? So there's no long-term side effects to starting and stopping um, birth control pills. Once again, they're very short-term. So the minute you stop them, they go away. You start them, they go back in. Yeah. Most clinics do that to go into what we call series or batching, meaning you start most people around the same time and to kind of assure that we have everything teed up perfectly. So it's like a recycling, uh, re no, wait, so re restarting the system. Exactly. It would be like that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, from people who are moving from IUI into IDF, what do you what do you recommend they think about? Prepare for with this new treatment process. How do we prefer for this more involved treatment in mind, body, and soul? Yeah. Very good question. Great question. Um, educate yourself, right? Most people transitioning from IUI to IVF think, I've done this before, I got this. So I think the only thing that you're used to is doing the blood and ultrasound. Um, I know that's what's going on for me. And then when you transition to IVF, it almost becomes a lot because then you have a lot more medication, mm -hmm. a lot more monitoring, a lot more scheduling. So I think just kind of educate yourself on expectations, how your clinic handles monitoring, how you set your appointments, how do you make time because now you're going to need a whole day off for recovery. Uh, maybe the next day uh, you're in pain for your retrieval. Um, as far as your... That's body goes, so optimize your health. Once again, Mediterranean diet, depending on your diagnosis for infertility, also look at how, how can you improve that. I talk to my patients about supplements. I think even though they're not proven or evidence-based, it helps to regain some of that control, kind of going back into that soul aspect. You feel transitioning and even seeing a fertility doctor, I think it's a loss of control mm -hmm. that most of us um, are used to having, right? You study this hard and go to this school. You interview and you get this job. Um, that's unfortunately not how fertility no, works. Eh? <laughs> uh, so I think understanding and getting control of things that you can control. And then as far as for what else you could do for the soul is don't be shy to seek out help, therapy, group support, because there's a lot more people going through it. The mind, the mind. The mind, The yes. mind, they always go back to that. Yeah. But going back to the other mind, the stomach, those eating certain foods, 
help you get pregnant. For example, people say that eating pineapple core helps to get pregnant. I never hear that. No? You know, I, I learn every day yeah. something new, I'm telling You're you. You're gonna love it because this is up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> I love pineapple, by the way. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> so pineapple core has something called bromelain in it. Bromelain is that potent antioxidant that lowers inflammation. So kind of going back to why does an attested normal embryo implant in a very perfect look looking uterus? And that's it. We don't really know. We don't know if they're communicating. We don't know if it's inflammation. What needs to activate? So apparently bromelain, if you eat it after an IUI or an embryo transfer, lowers this inflammation, thereby helping the embryo implant. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So it's the bromelain. And it's only in the core of the pineapple? It's only in the core of the pineapple. And the, the part that we throw to the garbage. Exactly. You see? Don't throw the core. No. It's, um, I tell patients that it does, it's not, once again, not evidence-based, not proven, but can't hurt. Your tongue can handle it. It's quite bitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, I, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying to bring as many as we can here. I don't know, we, can you go more into PCOs and the challenges, success rate of getting pregnant? Or we, we already talk about that. Yeah. yeah. There is anything else you would like to add? Um, just the diet to increase fertility. So before we were really good at fertility, what we do now, we used to say, let us put a, you on birth control and you know lose 10% of your body weight. That should make you fertile. Unfortunately, that's, I want, I want people to know that you are not causing this. You don't cause your PCOS, nor does diet and losing weight fix it. It's something, unfortunately, it's multifactorial, as Dr. Mora just said. A little bit is genetic, a little bit is environmental, and then we don't know why some people get it. So diet and exercise do help, do improve your success, but it does not make your fertility come back. Just like putting somebody on metformin to control their insulin, lose weight in PCO does not increase your success. Hmm. Opinion on FSH level of 14 in a 31-year-old. Doctor wants to test again and then maybe move on to IVF. What do you think? I think, so FSH, um, Alyssa, I have a slide on the level. If you can pull that up. So once again, FSH is your conductor. And if your conductor is working really, really hard to make your eggs ovulate, then sometimes that's a testament of quality. Um, right here, perfect. So I don't like to look at FSH alone. I like to look at FSH in the setting of estrogen because if your FSH is high, either there's something going on between your brain and your ovary, meaning they're not communicating, or the ovary is yelling back. And that term we use on Dr. Google, hormonal imbalance, refers to stuff like this with a high FSH or a high estrogen. Um, but yeah, it's a testament of quality. And we want this number typically to be less than 10. For somebody who's 31, it should be around a five or a six. Very interesting. So, you know, we went to talk about um, going to IBA and uh, all the infertility and we talk about the normal pregnancy, the natural pregnancy. What differentiates or what would tell the patient, okay, now is time to go and see an infertility doctor. When, when really is the, the, um, the sign, let's put in this, or the, the classification that this specific individual needs to see and, uh, a reproductive endocrinology? Yeah. And infertility. So general or basic definition is one year of unprotected intercourse under the age of 35, you should seek out fertility health. So if somebody doesn't get pregnancies in, the in one month or two months, doesn't mean that person is infertile. Correct. But I'm trying to shift the conversation with stuff like this okay. to make it instead of infertility, more fertility preservation. Because if you see... Oh, yeah. that's the, correct. Yeah. yeah. So if you think that you're you may want to get tested and you're questioning whether it's there, there's no harm in getting tested. So there was a the loss of control. Yes, this. I mean, I, I like that. So going to, an, to a reproductive endocrinology and infertility doesn't mean the woman is losing control. Correct. Yeah. It just, it wants to get, looking at the system of everything, is because it's prevention medicine, can Correct. we call it like that? Correct, preventative yeah. medicine. So it's not a failure going to see you <laughs> exactly. uh, it's just a preventive medicine is to check out to see, especially if there has been many years that yeah. um, have been not wanted to get uh, 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 to have a baby. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. 
Um, how much time should you wait between egg and FAT? We do it better to wait some, some cycles so your body heals from the uh, entropic process. Why don't we explain a little what is FET to, to the public? Yeah, FET means frozen embryo transfer. So egg retrieval, I'm assuming retrieval goes there, is a process of taking injection medications and then taking your eggs out. Then we create them to an embryo stage and then we freeze them. We allow your body then to get a period, which should be two weeks from your retrieval. And then in the following month, you can do a frozen embryo transfer. To truly understand this, I know IVF, this seems really scary and it's a lot to go through on your body, but physiologically, meaning looking purely medically, your body does that naturally every month. So if you emotionally, kind of your mind, body, and soul, going back to your yeah. old question, feel okay, there's no change in success, whether you wait one month, two months, three months. So long as you feel okay, medically, you can go right into an FET next month. Your body heals really quickly because it's doing what it's normally tuned to do. Yeah. Ovulate, get a period, and then ready for the next one. But now, there are studies suggesting that if you wait to the next cycle, if you freeze the embryo and you wait another cycle, then you do the transfer, may be more successful. Is that correct? And how would you explain that? Exactly. So that's what they're talking about here. So retrieval, correct. period, and then transfer. Mm -hmm. However, you don't need to wait more than that one month to transfer. You can follow it in the, you can transfer it in the following month. Um, but before, and maybe 2010 and earlier, we used to take it out and immediately, immediately put it back in. So that's a fresh embryo transfer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's the difference between the fresh and the frozen. Correct. Yeah. And there is nothing wrong with the, pre the freezing. The, the exactly. So freezing embryos, freezing all sites. A very important subject, I think, especially in our time where we are delaying the production. Yeah. The majority of women start getting babies yeah. 34, 33, and so on. And there is a lot of talk about freezing. Yeah. What is the difference between freezing embryos and freezing oocytes? So freezing uh, X oocytes is just you, just female. It's half the half of the embryo. But being half, it's very, very small. It's one cell. It's the largest cell of your body, but still one cell. So when you freeze it, the thaw survival of that egg is 80% on average. Wow. That's the, the thaw survival. Oh, it's 80%. 80%. So it's a good, it's a it's good, good percentage. It's not yeah. so bad. Okay. But an embryo is the egg and the sperm, and it's thousands and thousands of cells. It's actually mm. separated into baby and placenta. So the thaw survival of an embryo is about 98%. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. So for a woman, once you will consider saving the oocytes or the embryo, oh, let's put it, let's go more to the, when should a woman consider to, to freeze the, the oocytes, the eggs? So freezing eggs. If you I always say, if you're thinking about freezing eggs, that means you're in a place and a position in your life where you don't want to have kids and younger eggs are always better. So okay. So the younger, the better if you want to freeze the oocytes. Correct. And I think that's a question of our, our, uh, our, is there a significant difference between just freezing your eggs and freezing embryos? If you are single and only have the option of freezing your eggs, will it affect the quality and less than success of getting pregnant later? versus either freezing embryo FET? That's a great question. So it's short and simple, no. To freeze eggs is better than freezing nothing. If yeah. you are in a relationship, freezing embryos is great because you know the developmental potential of your eggs. So for example, on average, you need about 15 to 20 eggs for 80% chance of one live birth versus three tested normal embryos for an 80% chance of one live birth because you actually know the ability of your egg to then make an embryo. But if you're single and you're not in that position, then it's better to freeze an egg. If you're in a relationship and you freeze embryos, make sure also the legal aspects yes. are well determined. I don't think we will discuss legal aspects because that's another hour of yeah. conversation. But I think it, for everybody is should have the message that whatever you're freezing, make sure that you have all the legal aspects clearly 
uh, clarify, yes. correct? Yes. Any other advice that you will want to give about that subject? Make sure you actually want to have babies with somebody, don't settle, because then you're tied to them. You can't unhook those eggs. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of causes of anti follicles in IVF with good follicle count prior to egg retrieval and a low number of eggs retrieved? That's a great question. To answer that completely, specifically for you, I would need to know your baseline AMH, FSH, and estrogen. But in general, empty follicles can happen for a multitude of reasons. So FSH triggers, meaning the shots that you take, triggers the ovaries to respond and produce eggs. Sometimes if our egg count and quality are really low, it just forms, it responds, over ovary responds, but there's nothing in there, meaning no good eggs activate and grow. So that's number one, quality. Important, yeah. Number two is if your egg count was very high and say sometimes a doctor choose to do a lower dose trigger, maybe didn't cause so your eggs are attached, it looks like a little cyst to the sidewall. And when you take your trigger shot, it causes the egg to separate into half of you and float in the middle. And then we aspirate and suck it out through a needle with ultrasound guidance. So if your trigger did not work, sometimes it's still attached to the wall and we don't get the egg. Very so fascinated that we can do those things. Yeah. Eh? It's incredible. But I remember when I was at medical school in my trainings, uh, we used to transfer four, five, six embryos yeah. just to make sure that one at least will get. Yeah. Are you all still transferring six, seven no. embryos? No. <laughs> <laughs> we prefer to do what's called a single embryo transfer, but things have changed because we also did not know how to culture them in the lab past day three. So we would take them out, fertilize them. And on day three, when they had it separated into baby and placenta, on day three is when the paternal, meaning the dad activates, and then it actually becomes two different cell lines, baby and placenta. But before then- The placenta is the, the external part correct. of the baby will give origin to this incredible organ yeah. that we call the placenta, yeah. which we love to study the placenta yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then before, when we didn't know how to do that, and it was on day three, we, one, we didn't have the option of growing it further because we just didn't know what the nutrient needs of the embryo were. So we would put them all in because we also were not good at You didn't know what is what is going to develop. Exactly. Or we didn't know what was going to develop yeah. in those days. Now you know what is going to yeah. develop. Yeah. So, but, so today, how many embryos will you transfer usually? Typically, what's preferred is what's called an ESA, an elective single embryo transfer. Exactly. Big difference. Yeah. So now then, and wh why the difference? I mean, in, in my time, we used to have ladies with three, four, five ba babies, yeah. which is, is a blessing, but it's also it's dangerous very, for, yeah. for the mother. Very dangerous pregnancy, uh, severe prematurity, higher risk of pregnancy related complications, C-section rate. We don't want that. We want one healthy baby and healthy mom. Exactly. So them, keep the mother healthy and, and happy. If we have a question that is, is a fascinating question. And I think we can touch it now as we're getting closer to the end of the hour. Does IVF success chances increase with donor egg? Yes. So remember, donor egg is eliminating what we find the rate limiting factor of fertility, which is the female's age. Not to ignore the male, we just quite don't understand the male as much as we understand the female. So much of our focus and studies have been done on the egg, egg health, egg chromosomes, implantation. So when you eliminate the age component of the female and you add in the donor egg, you notice your chance of success goes up significantly. So is the age. So a young woman that needs to be still can use her own eggs. Correct. Is that age, uh, as we, the woman start aging, as we say at the beginning, is the, um, the limiting factor is the oocytes, yeah. the eggs. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, we know that a woman even in the 50, 60, and now 70 in India, uh, with donor eggs, they can get pregnant. Yes, yeah. Not recommended at the age of 70, yeah? No, which is 82, right? <laughs> oh, it's 82? 82. But it was 72, but maybe it's another one. Yeah. My goodness, the oldest one now is 82. 82. Every time is 10 years older. Yeah. What is an 82? Oh, wow. Hopefully. <laughs> My goodness. It's not a good thing. <laughs> but there is an interesting aspect that you mentioned 
about the, the men. We thought always that the men, it doesn't matter the age, it still has, can have a normal contribution. But clearly it's not the case. No, no, no. Now there are several studies with, because there is a good number of men, older men marrying yeah. younger women yeah. who can, we look at really at the effect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the man also goes at a kind of aging yeah. sperms yeah. and the quality also decreasing yeah. even younger. Or they still can produce but the quality is decreased, correct? Okay. Excellent. Um, can high TPO antibodies affect implantation fertility in general? Do you believe AIP diets can help with fertility in case of autoimmune diseases? Uh, autoimmune diseases is a serious complication. Yeah, yeah. Um, loaded question, yes. The we loaded do. question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we do check for TPO antibodies. Now, could you just explain to little us mm -hmm. for those who are not in, in the, in the uh, problem or in the area, what is the meaning of TPO antibodies? Yeah, so TPO antibody stands for thyroid peroxidase antibody. One of the reasons we focus on the thyroid hormone and thyroid gland and how it's interlinked to fertility is because when you look at the conductor, the brain, and FSH and TSH, their biochemical organic structures are very similar. So when you have discrepancies or abnormalities in the thyroid, you tend to see them with fertility as well. Just like if your thyroid is off, you tend to see menstrual irregularities. So when you have a high TPO antibody, it's been shown to cause a mis higher miscarriage rate. So as a fertility doctor, even in the setting of normal thyroid hormones with positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies, we do treat them with a synthroid to try to lower the antibodies. Now, do I believe like an anti-inflammatory diet and autoimmune disease can contribute to implantation failure? 100%. I think Dr. Moore and I talk about this all the time and um, just because it's not known doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So I think it's very unfair to dismiss it. Correct. Correct? Yeah. Um, but I think it's a world that we still need to study and understand how to regulate it and how to control it. That is the, that is the right message. It's correct. Yeah. Every day we're learning new things. Yeah. And what we thought it was the explanation for everything, now we know that it was wrong. Yeah. So, but there are some bases that um, we continue grow, uh, developing on them. Yeah. That the, definitely there is no um, a question. Uh, we have another interesting question here. Does low ovarian reserve mean low quality? I am 36, not me, the person <laughs> who's asking. I'm 36 and won a second child, had two miscarriages after my daughter and I would really like to avoid IVF, but also don't want another miscarriage. My issue has never been getting pregnant though, so maybe IVF will be the same risk as natural. Complicated. Complicated. Um, once again, a great question. So when you look at um, diminished ovarian reserve or low AMH, uh, what happens is there's, like a, there's a great paper that looks at the transition of females so eventually, what it starts off is lower reserve, which yes, a lower reserve can go hand in hand with lower quality. And the analogy I use for my patients is, imagine you're picking somebody to be on your team for basketball or baseball, right, when you're younger. Who are you gonna pick? You're gonna pick the quickest, the fastest, the best, mm, right? I like that. Yeah. That's why your peak fertility is at age 23, when your recruitment of your eggs are the picking person. the best players. Mm. And then as we get older, what's left in there, the quality starts to decline. So when you look at diminished reserve, it first starts with pregnancy loss, meaning recurrent pregnancy loss, mm -hmm. and then it shifts to infertility, and then it shifts to perimenopause. So yes, you can get pregnant, but there is, if you look at reproductive endocrinology and fertility, we specialize in pregnancy loss because of it. We're catching this qualitative and quantitative factor early on. So what Typically, why we see miscarriages with a low reserve is the chromosomal component. So when your eggs are splitting, it's not dividing right. That's the most common reason. So 80% of miscarriages happen because of chromosomal abnormality. Mm -hmm. With IVF, to address that, does IVF, genetic testing, and then transfer the tested normal embryo, which doesn't eliminate your risk of miscarriage, but significantly reduces it. Mm. So there is no doubt that the complexity of pregnancy is, is huge and we're trying to understand really we thought that everything was the maternal side yeah? the mother can accept the baby or cannot accept the baby 
in reality is a conversation, is a communication, is a relationship yeah. between the, the embryo and the mother. The embryo is telling, okay, I'm healthy, I'm good, receive me. Yeah. The mother, the endometrium will accept that healthy and will check again yeah. and say, wait, you don't look healthy. Yeah. And in a way, miscarriage is, is a way of saying, hey, this baby may not make it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a natural selection. Yeah. And but we trying to do is to to fix some of those problems. So the communication between the mother and the baby will not end in, in a divorce. Yeah, yeah. And keep it a happy marriage. Yeah. Which is always what we want. Yeah. yeah. Um, how are we going on time? My goodness, we're getting close to seven o'clock. What does a fertility specialist test for on the first or second visit? Perfect. I like how you said first or second. <laughs> The first visit, we typically do a very detailed history. So we want to understand how long you've been trying, what have you done, have you taken pills? So sometimes I always ask my patients, have you gone, done any treatment? They say automatically no, because they assume treatment always happens only with me. But sometimes OBs can give you ovulation induction. So it's very important for us to understand where you're coming from and what you've done. So your first appointment will consist of one, understanding your detailed history and physical. And one question I leave my patients with is what is your ideal family size? Like what brings you to me? And where do you hope to be when you mm, come back? Yeah. So I think I'm slowly trying to shift that conversation into not just I'm here for this baby and I'll come back to you for number two, because once again, time is important. And then your second appointment will follow your menstrual cycle. So then we can understand your body so your first appointment for testing, for diagnostic, will be on the first five days of your period, any day. You can come day one, day two, day three, day four, or five, when you're bleeding to do blood work and ultrasound. And what we're looking for, where were those slides that Alyssa was so kindly sharing, is your egg count. Yeah. So your AMH, your FSH, your estrogen, and then we do a transvaginal ultrasound. So we look for these hormones. And then we match it to your ultrasound. So the next slide you'll see, and that is called your antral follicle count. And then your third appointment will consist of looking at your uterus and your tubes. So that's your saline sonogram. So two more slides down, right here, um, sorry, right there. So we'll look inside your uterus, we'll look at your tubes, and then your partner, if you're in a relationship, will get the fun test where we look at the sperm. And that is an area that maybe we we will organize yes. an a special session yes. to talk about the male, yes. because uh, for many years when the family had uh, they didn't have children, all the blame was on the woman. Yes. Now we know that that's not the case. That maybe it's a 50-50. Yeah. There is a high number of infertility in male as exactly. well. Yeah. So just for those who are join us late, and um, le let me remind you that this session is record is live uh, uh, shared on Facebook, is recorded, and will be posted in the website of the Mod Center, as well as in, um, in a podcast. So you can have access and review this conversation if you couldn't hear the, the whole session, or share with your friends who may be interested in the subject and couldn't join us today, that it is available uh, in podcast and also live on, on Facebook. Um, there is uh, an interesting question here. We, uh, we're learning a lot. Are antibiotics after uh, over hydrosulfonates or after H HSG helpful? So if you have a history of a previous pelvic infection or hydrosulfates, meaning a dilated tube, because we don't know what caused it, we do do give prophylactic antibiotics to prevent spreading anything. And that links to what we discussed last week, that is uh, bacterial vaginosis, infections of the vagina, uh, the, the, nor the role of normal bacteria and abnormal bacteria on fertility, yeah. Yeah, which I think is, is a fascinating area. We know that abnormal bacteria is not good, yeah. Yeah. and that has to be treated and prevent it for fertility. What is the role of the normal commensal bacteria uh, in helping uh, fertility is, is a subject that is fascinating and I think we're just learning. Yeah. Yeah. 
but look at the bacteria in the vagina. Yeah. It's important. It is, it is necessary to wait between IVF cycles. Do back to the cycles can adverse effects on outcome? Great question. So back to back cycles, short and simple, do not have an adverse effect on your outcome. If you're a poor responder or you have decreased ovarian reserve, there's something called a duostim. So your follicular recruitment happens in typically three month cycles, meaning your eggs are activated the cycle before. So what a dual stim is saying, well, if they're activated the cycle before, how do I increase my odds of getting more eggs? So typically what we do is we do a retrieval, we wait a couple days, and then we start stimulation again to then try to get your luteal, meaning after you retrieve those eggs that are there, and then the growth from the following month to hopefully increase your odds of getting more eggs. So no adverse effects. You may not like being on injections for that long, but it may help um, in the number of eggs retrieved. Now, I'm wondering if some people may have thought because the Eastern time, you came from Central time. Yes. Yeah? Oh, so I <laughs> see some people joining us that may, may have their thought that we were talking seven o'clock uh, Central time, which is now no. seven o'clock Central time. But again, for those who are just joining us in the Central time, let me remind you that all this fascinating conversation has been recorded and will be available to everybody for free um, at the, our website, as well as the podcast of the CS Mod Center. Uh, I have a question that is very personal from one of our listeners. What is the absolute sure way of knowing AFC? Sometimes I'm told that they just see two, sometimes seven and sometimes 11. And the doctor feels this could be many cysts. I don't have PCOS. Is there a way to differentiate between mini cyst and follicle? Yeah, so correlated to your AMH. So antral follicle count and AMH go hand in hand. The higher your AMH, the more antrals you see. The lower your AMH, the fewer antrals you see. Now remember your antral follicle count every month will vary. Every month you'll get a new batch of antral follicles. So it's not abnormal to be five one month and three one month and so on and so forth, because every month, different number of eggs activate. Fantastic. Ruki, we are already two minutes over the seven o'clock and I know you have to go back to your clinic. You have patients to see and I really appreciate that you came all the way from Chicago to join us to this. Uh, we will do it again and we will have, I know there is a lot of questions still. Uh, there is the conversation of, uh, Donate, uh, the all site donation, the, the consequences and so on. A lot of questions to discuss. Again, we see that a lot of people are joining at seven o'clock central time. And my apologies for not clarifying that. That's okay, that's my fault for posting, I'm sorry. And, and again, we want to remind everybody, uh, you can admit them, um, that if you join us late, you can have access to all this fantastic conversation we will do it again. Uh, we will discuss more, more aspects of, um, of infertility. So just to finish, to summarize, yeah, our body is a communication between the brain and every single tissue. Yeah. Fertility reproduction is a basic instinct that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the a critical for maintaining the species. So in general, we are made to successful reproduction. However, sometimes things doesn't go well. And it can be either because the conductor is not working properly or the environment yeah. is affected. Yeah. So take control, yeah. make sure that your body is communicating with your brain, with your hormones, with your reproductive organs. And also with that baby when it's coming, make sure that the communication with that baby is the appropriate one. Yeah, 100%. Yeah? yeah? Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I enjoy and I learn a lot. Thank you. And I'm sure our listeners also have learned. Um, looking forward for next month, we are having a discussion about gynecological diseases and we will talk, we'll touch the subject of an abnormal ovary, that is ovarian cancer. Looking forward to talk next month about ovarian cancer. 
Thank you so much for joining us this evening.